Okay, good. All right, so I have the best talk time because in about 30 minutes we're going to be going to get some Chick-fil-A. So I say that to say this. Anybody that wants to ask questions, just remember, you're holding everybody else up in here from getting free Chick-fil-A, right? So that is my get-out-of-jail-free card, right? And I didn't have to pay anybody for that. So first off, uh, by way of introduction, I'm Jack Coons. I am the speaker for the next 30 minutes. Um, until August 1st of this year, I was a Army officer over at Fort Gordon um, in what we now call the uh, 17 series, which is the Cyber Warfare Officers. Um, but I have about 15 to 20 years of experience prior to that doing uh, both what we would refer to as intelligence activities on net and then slowly morphing to um, what we refer to as effects on net. And so I'll start off with a real quick joke here to see who gets it. And by the way, whoever the last is, is kind of self-identified, so I know you'll have to answer questions for uh, What's the difference between a computer network attack and a computer network exploitation? When you're doing it right, you're doing exploitation. The minute you mess up and you screw up the apple or you reconfigure something, uh, and you quickly brick the route, that just became an effect. And all of a sudden, at that moment, you stand up and you say, Yeah, I meant to do that. We're not doing computer network attack, not computer network exploitation. Since nobody laughed, then I now know I can answer questions from this guy. So I see Corey's is over there, so now I already know what's going to happen to these questions from this side of the room. Uh, so the reason I got into this business is just, uh, it's like jumping out of planes. I don't like heights. I don't like jumping out of planes, but I like being out with people that do. Um, same thing with computer network operations, uh, network administration, basically being a kind of geek at heart. I like hanging around with people like this. I get a lot smarter hanging around with people like these, people like Corey and some other people while I'm sitting here. So there's a lot of extremes in this room. What I'm going to talk to you about today, though, is something called microsegmentation. So, by a quick show of hands, who here already knows about microsegmentation? Is familiar with it? Has heard of it before? Okay, so either you're lying or you're here because you want to learn about it. So, the bottom line is this I heard the previous speaker talk about segmentation. You're probably familiar with these types of things, right? So, we're already doing that. You're doing segmentation right now. People are in this room, right next to us is another room, right? So we have a physical separation between people, right? What I'm going to talk to you about is something different. And actually, it's very important because, like I said, I was hired August 1st from the White Wall building over at Fort Gordon. Uh, and I now took a position, you can probably guess my current employer uh, uses. So it's a very interesting place to be right now in the world of cybersecurity because most of my adult life and from you know, how I was brought up and by that I mean the lens that I look at problems was one of how do I get in? Whether it's remote access, right? Somebody from sanctuary going on net to get into a box to what we call a clear understanding of Okay, yeah. So you know, uh, the CAO, Post Access Network Operations. It's like calling up Bryce and saying when the TV doesn't work, you can talk all day you want to that lady on the phone, but at some point we're going to get to a conversation where she's going to say, Sir, I'm just going to send out some hours that I need to do on the phone. That guy that comes to your house, that was the other thing that I did. So that is the way that I look at the world. And by the way, when I say the world, that literally was what I'm talking about. The world was my footprint. Right? Anywhere the target was, you could go to the target to gain access. Either they're on the spot or to enable remote operations. So now I'm on the outside. I'm on the outside, that is not what we do because legally we do not do things like that. So I am looking at the problem now with another unique perspective, which is one of how do I prevent the things that I know that could happen, potentially could happen, and more importantly, is currently one. Right? So for those of you that are here, you saw the title of this brief, and you saw zero day and zero trust, and you came to hear this specifically so you can hear spillage. That's not going to happen in here, so I'm going to let them know that you should have done it right now. There's really a honeypot to get people in here because they're curious. Because microsegmentation in and of itself is kind of a boring subject, but it gets exciting if you start overlaying the actual threat vectors. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right into this here and see if the uh, thing works. There it is. Now, I said I'm a geek. And in the world that I work in, the world of talk, I go to the lab. Everything has a code, everything has a fry graph, everything has a cover or another name for it, right? So we typically use Blue Ring Runner. So we 
So we all know who that is. Okay? This is gonna get old, this is a meme, right? But however, there it is. You've all seen the news, right? Who here has not been aware of what's been flashed all over the all over the news in the past month with the tool sets that have been released? May or may not have been released. What's that? Bottom line is, if you're putting hardware onto a network, right? The old days of putting infrastructure in place, hardware infrastructure, to prevent an adversary from gaining access, those days, that, that period is slowly coming to an end, right? There's a new reality out there. And in the old days, where a nation state literally took millions of man hours, millions of FTEs, full time equivalents, right? People working day and night in a very rigorous, very very clean conditions and under, let's just say, in the government, you can use the phrase, cost is no objective, right? Spending millions of dollars to develop exquisite tools that are tailored, no pun intended, that are tailored to do one special thing, right? Some of those things are out there right now. And a bored teenager can now, I'm not going to say be purpose, because most of them don't know what they typically do, they just, I need to be done. Point it in another direction and fire it off to see what happens. Okay. That's the new reality that we're operating in right now. It makes my talk very easy. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be on a plane here today and going to London to speak at a garden conference for security in Europe because everyone's now aware of it. I don't have to worry about security because everybody is now dealing with that new reality right now. So, what that really means is you combine a couple things the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, and more importantly, tools that are now out there to the wire unintended, right? And a recognition and an understanding that didn't exist before, right? Your ability under cost restrictions to protect your networks is going to be under duress every day. You're going to be severely challenged to make that thing happen in some type of regulatory compliance measure that sits on top of it. Now, what I'm going to tell you here, let's stop for a quick second. I'm not telling you to be part of this, right? That's not the point, right? What I'm going to tell you though, is Properly done, I have a presentation allows you and affords you the ability to literally increase the level of security far above what any firewall could do. You can get past what the level of the security would be what we call trust level. Right? Because that's how the human body works, right? It's probably the greatest network of all. The human body is designed to take things constantly, it's under duress constantly. And guess what? It microseconds at the cellular level. And what I mean by microsegmentation, for our world, it is encrypted. I'm talking packet level segmentation. I'm not talking about PUZ, PUZ. I'm not talking about segmentation. I'm not talking about those instances of I am going to put a uh, you know an IP range over here and IP range over here. I'm literally talking at the well, if we talk IP version six, I'm talking about every molecule in your body and the unique IP address and the unique address and the name correlation to that. That's currently happening right now. Now, what we're doing, I'll tell you that um, in the sense of doing it, there are a lot of folks in this space right now, right? So it's a sales pitch. This is something very interesting to do. From an adversary's perspective, right now, you don't know that you're safe right now because someone is not looking at you. If somebody has the time and the willingness, they will more than likely get inside your record. What you can choose to do is mitigate how much damage a person in that way can get inside your body. So, my favorite line in the movie, when you move over to the other side, you can use that as security and security. This is typical of the conversation that you have, whether you're in the DOD, the intelligence community, or now in the commercial sector. Right? Everybody wants to feel safe. Everybody wants to make sure that they have uptime. Everybody wants to make sure that their thing will still work, even when they're taking the next people around. Now, I'm a huge geek, so this is another favorite of mine. Right here, this reference. You remember what it says at this moment? This is a direct quote. This is exactly what he said. <laughs> okay. So what I mean by this is the, the end. Software-defined networks. Yes, I got it. Good. So what I mean by is the end. Software-defined networks, right? And then microsegmentation, just like I said earlier, microsegmentation, right? This is the world that we're living in right now. This is what literally is happening out there, and you guys are living and breathing it right now. Right? So let's go ahead and jump into it. This is why we're doing it, right? This is no, I'm not going to bore you like this morning. You guys live this. You guys know what it is. 
What you want to do, though, and what we're trying to do, is get away from just basically saying, here is my DMZ, and therefore everything inside my DMZ I trust, and therefore it's allowed to move around and do what it wants to do, right? We call that, as you guys know, east-west traffic. We call that lateral movement. That's about, depending on what metrics you use out there in the world, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of traffic inside the data center is not even looked at because it's assumed to be safe. It's assumed to be trusted, right? I will tell you, in my world, those are those are that's the place where pivot points occur. That's the point where you start having people moving around. And this is this goes beyond outsider threat. This could be insider threat. And when I say threat. The threat to me is not some purpose, some purpose-driven individual trying to do bad things to your network. An insider threat to me is some knucklehead who doesn't know what they're doing, who's moving around or changing something, or just bored one day and is looking around at things that they're not supposed to. The guy in operations that's looking at financial data. The guy that's in finance that's looking at HR data. The person that wants to know, I'm making $50,000 a year. And I have lunch with this guy, and I don't like him, and I want to know how much he's making a year. By the way, we just got bonuses, right? That kind of stuff. So that's what we're talking about here. So what you want to get to is something called zero trust or an earned trust model, which means literally every IP packet inside of your world has to earn the trust to communicate. So for example, I no longer talk to Corey because Corey and I have history. I have to prove to Corey that he and I can have a conversation back and forth. So in a way, you kind of get like encryption. It kind of becomes a handshake between encryption, all right? That's the old model. Little uh, little FYI there. Does everybody know what the purpose of the moat is? Why do they have moats around castles? By the way, everybody uses this. We see this all the time because there's one place to get in and one place to get out, and there's very well-defined places where things are. So, for example, this silo here would be your HR data. This silo over here may be your financial data stream or uh, data center. Over there, you may have some uh, intellectual property sitting over there. In DOD, you could have classified space, you can have something over here. And there's a one way in and one way out, it's well defined, and the perimeter is nice and it's easily understood. What's the purpose of the moat though? That's very close. Okay, I remember remember in the beginning I said Corey's over there and I said Wally's right there. This is why Wally doesn't get asked questions because he's that guy. And you were gonna say something? Right, I'm going to do you one better. Think of the OSI model. Everybody understand the OSI model, right? Reference that we all understand so that we can do what? Communicate and have relationships with each other. The purpose of the moat, the actual reason that moats were existing around these things is because people would tunnel from the outside in underneath the wall. And the water in the moat would actually flood the tunnel. That was the purpose of the moat. Now, think of the OSI model. You got applications up here. Right? If I am really good at what I'm doing, I can keep deep diving into that OSI model to get through your defenses to the point where if I'm, and it's not me, but there are individuals out there that literally can, can, that can work at a machine code language level. And guess what? Nothing stops them. They will literally crunch through and grind almost as if they're trying to into your network, right? The point to all this is to reinforce the fact that in this world that we're moving in, as people get more and more developed, we're having a problem. Also, another little piece of trivia. You guys know how the, uh, the stairs in these things work? Stairs always go in a certain direction because typically you have a sword, you have, you have your shield like this, and you have a sword like this, right? So when the adversary is coming up to get you, what you do is you force him to have to have his sword so every stair in an ancient castle will go like this. Because what you do is you keep his sword against the wall, but if I'm the guy protecting it, my sword is where? It's on the outside. So I get to smack you and come up, right? It has nothing to do with cyber. So just <laughs> threw that in there. Anyway, that's an important thing though for you guys though. 80% of most IT budgets, perimeter defense. Why? Because it's easy, it's well understood, it ticks the box on risk and audit and compliant things that we have to you know, do. Um, and it, like for example, I'm not a cybersecurity person. I possess not one certificate that is industry recognized. But guess what? I probably won't be able to get a job at certain companies because they have a requirement for someone to have a CIA certificate. So I have to explain, I went to JNAC for 30 days. How does JNAC, Joint Network Tech Force, how does that relate? My 30 days down in Florida, how does that relate to somebody who, who basically studied a book and got a certified ethical hacker? Right? So this is a difficult conversation. But yet, that's how we live, right? Now, the other question, the takeaway from the slide though is this. 
I would challenge anybody that works in network defense, cyber security, to tell me, explain to me, show me in a Visio diagram the physical and logical topology of your network. Tell me which perimeter looks like. Tell me where the boundary is on that map where it says, here's the end of my understanding, and then there's this ancient dragon that says, here be dragons, and there's like some weird ancient antique pictures up there. I would challenge you to show me that. Okay, you all know what shadow IT is? Everybody here know what shadow IT is? Right, legacy boxes, shadow IT, the dude that punched something in just because something didn't work. For example, this morning, Mr. Joyce, the guy from TAL, could not get his computer hooked up because of the GPGA cable, right? So this is the kind of conversations we all live in, right? But yet, guess what? He got hooked up. How did he get hooked up? Because somebody in the audience brought up a cable and plugged it in. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if I was somebody that if I had come here preloaded with my thing, with some firmware or something sitting on that thing, and I would have given it to the guy that runs CAO to plug into his box so that he could plug it in. You guys see where I'm going with this, right? This is the way the adversary thinks. Right. So, point is, this is our world, folks, right? And then we've got the insider threat. What made Edward Snowden devastating? Right? What made him devastating? It was the ability for him to get inside and basically have full heart launch of everything and look around inside the networks. Now, yes, he used credentials from other people. He did some other things, but the fact is, he was able to move around inside your network. That's the ultimate insider threat. But it could have been another knucklehead, right? So the, the, the threat may not have been Edward, no Edward Snowden. The threat really was the individual that let him use his identification card and his credentials to get in. That's the threat, right? So you want to use microsegmentation to get around that. You guys have all seen this. Everyone's familiar with the kill chain, right? It's out there. You can do the research on it. This is a kill chain. There's actually a new version of this, the expanded cyber kill chain, which talks about the insider threat and the pivot points on the inside. But you get through this. The key here is that most network administrators don't have the time, the money, the patience, or the visibility to look at that 80% of piece traffic that's going on inside of what they consider to be their network, right? Microsegmentation can help that. That's the area, that's my research, that's what I'm looking at because it's a very, it's a very rich vein and a lot of companies are looking at it right now because we go forward. Here's how it works. And by the way, I'm going to park for a second right now because I'm going to caveat it by saying a couple of things. Three ways of looking at the world today. You have permanent sites, right? Companies like uh, a financial institution. They don't want to put anything anywhere else. They want to lock it down so that they know it's right here. All of my financial transactions occur right here, or all of my IT sits right here. So I want to be able to look at that, that data center every day. Then there are some, I call them cloud babies. There are people that literally go into Amazon AWS and they go, I will create my company, I will create my startup, and I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to go shopping and I'm going to get some server time, I'm going to get some security, go to my shopping list, and, boop, and then they check it out, and guess what? There's no physical representation of this company. They are literally of the cloud, born of cloud. Then there's a hybrid, which is what most companies, including DOD, including the intelligence agencies, including pretty much everybody right now, is moving to this hybrid model, right? So those are your three models. The, that third hybrid model, you have a permanent facility where they may keep control of their IP because it just makes them feel better at night. But yet they have mobile device users that are all over the place and they want to be able to give them real time, near real time access to things like applications. So for example, Office 365. Why would, why on earth would I want to deluge my network administrators and have them deal with all that crap? I want to have to focus on what I want them to focus on, which is protecting my IP. So I'm going to host 365 with Azure up in the cloud and let that application run back and forth, let Microsoft worry about it. That's the hybrid model, right? But those three things are what's going on right here, and that's what you're going to see here. So what we have, you guys can read that. And by the way, the slides, I'm not going to talk to the slides. I hate slides. These are here for you if you want them afterwards so you can go back and refresh on what we're talking about. But basically, this is what we do, right? You bifurcate and you segment all this stuff up here, and then you can easily divide it. This is really nothing new. What I want you to get your head wrapped around is this. You kind of do this already today. But what we're trying to do right now and what companies are doing right now is they are literally encrypting at the packet level the relationship between communities of interest back and forth. And we're going to go through a couple of things here. So this is exactly the takeaway of the slide. This is what it is, right? There's a use case out there. You guys can do the research. There's a use case right now where a company, actually not a company, take that back, a, a state, a U.S. state, went from well over 100,000 ACLs, right? Everybody spends an ACLs, right? ACLs controllers, right? The, the definite, you know, the, the, the signat not the signatures, but the, uh, the actual ACL, they went and collapsed that from over 100,000 to about 100 by using microsegmentation, right? That's why microsegmentation, microsegmentation is powerful. And by combining microsegmentation with software-defined networks, think about it like this. With a software-defined network, 
you can roll out in a matter of minutes something that you could never do with hardware because what happens with hardware? What do you have to do with hardware? Say again? You have to go and place it. So if you're a company or you have a global workforce and you have to install a firewall, you now have the incurred logistical cost of I've got to go and place my Cisco pizza box that's sitting on a rack somewhere in a closet. You have to physically go there and you've got to place the Cisco box, right? With a software-defined network, you don't have to do that. You get away from a lot of that stuff. So you get a cost savings there, right? Which is a very interesting thing. Um, who's the other one? Okay, so the, the bottom line for this, though, is we're already doing things like Active Directory. We're already doing things like LDAP. We're already doing things in DOD like, you know, the other thing. You see, I guess it's five minutes there. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to burn through here real quick. So here's three use cases of what we've got going on, right? We have intellectual property. On the top is the challenge. On the bottom is what happens when you have micro-segmentation. So we've already talked about intellectual property, right? You have access to the corporate data center, right? But the problem is everybody's got it. You don't want everybody to have that. With software-defined networks and micro-segmentation, you can use advanced cryptography. We're talking about 256 grade, so military grade encryption, right? That protects, creates those tunnels, and it only allows those communities of interest to go to it. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the really interesting part. There are companies out there right now that are literally using shims in layer two and layer three. So this is not something that Jack is talking to you about that's in the 2B future. This is happening right now. What they do is they put a shim, an agent, in between layer two and layer three. That shim basically looks like, for example, me and Corey. Corey will send, hey Jack, are you there? If Corey and I are not assigned an active directory to the same community of interest, I won't even respond to Corey. I'll just drop the packets. So what, why is that powerful? What does that do? Right? It denies the adversary the ability to map and understand the network. In a dungeon crawler, the screen stays black. You're not turning lights on and learning a little bit more, right? You effectively cloak and darken the end nodes or the actual things that you don't want them to have authorization to, right? And so really, the network administrator is the only one with a Harry Potter Marauders map, right? That's the only thing. And that is where you focus all of your resources. You protect the Marauders map. You don't waste your money out there protecting the amorphous perimeter that you would be challenged to even understand what it looks like. I'm going to try and burn through here. End of life devices, for example, everybody works in companies that still use XP, right? Is XP supported anymore? But, I, but you know what you're not going to do? You're not going to turn it off and replace it. Why? Because it's probably still running, and you may not even know where it is, right? You're not going to turn it off, so you've got an end-of-life device sitting out there that's not supported, not patched, right? So you can basically circle that thing, and you can segment that thing off of something else, right? So what are you doing in a nutshell? And again, data central, this, this makes sense, everybody, I'm not going to go through this. Security cloud, kind of already talked about. What are you, what are you doing? Really, the goal with micro-segmentation, we can talk more offline about this, you're doing two things. You want to reduce the attack surface that you present to the adversary. And when I say adversary, I talk about everybody in the company that I work for that is not in a community of interest or we're a security group that they were assigned to, as well as everybody outside of the company, right? You reduce the attack surface, but then also in the business world, which I'll be honest with you, I never had to worry about before, but it's very apparently very apparent to the important commercial sector. You reduce the auditor, the audit and re regulatory service, right? So if you have credit card information and it flows across your entire network, guess what has to be guess what has to be in compliance and gets audited constantly? The entire freaking network. Right? What if you can segment that, micro-segment that and encrypt it so that the financial data only flows around here and all of the transport, all the infrastructure that supports it is segmented off and encrypted away from it, which is what companies are moving to right now? Guess what? Guess what doesn't get audited now? The 90% that makes it happen and the only thing that gets audited is that. So you can start to see the cost savings here. And again, I'm going to burn through here because I want to get through. You guys look at that? That's it because I wanted to free up some time here. How much time do I have for questions? All right, so we've got about five minutes for questions. So anybody besides Tori and Wally that has a question? Yeah. Really? Giveaways or can I keep it? I'm just kidding. All right. Sir. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so, and again, I'm trying to 
I mean, I don't want to say, but there's quite a couple cells out there that this company has used uh, in the different DOD uh, cells and the cell tests. But not just cell. There's about six or seven major companies that are moving into these things. Obviously, Microsoft is moving in there. Um, uh, NSX is in there right now. Uh, there's a bunch of other companies that are in there right now. I don't want this to be a sales pitch because I didn't join Microsoft. To get, uh, uh, I'm not here for the sale pitch. I'm here because I'm interested in micro segmentation and in a tax service and using the tax service. And also by a tax service, I want to remove the adversary's ability to have pivot points and establish pivot points. And by the way, with stealth, what it also does is even if someone were to come in and get around micro segmentation by literally plugging USB in, by by uh, doing the uh, shift between layer two and three, what it prevents is anything beaconing out because it will not allow the beacon out to even occur. So the malware will not be able to go outside the network. It'll still be alive, but it won't be able to touch the command control server and it won't be able to exfil any data. So that's huge. So back to bring this all 360, what that really does to, it, you go in now, it changes the paradigm, right? You're not going into this with the, how do I protect everybody, everything from everybody? What you do is you go in with an understanding that we're probably going to get hit and we're probably going to take attacks all the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to physically and logically choose where we want to assume risk and then ally all the other hardware against what we, you know, want to do rather than put all the sensors and everything out where we don't want to do. Any other questions? Got a couple more minutes. Sir. Sure. It's software economy. The problem is it depends. Depending on your network, depending on which company you're talking about, depending on what your infrastructure and your policy looks like, you can go into your software model, so they'll roll it out and install software on your system, and then you can deploy that in and scale that thing out. And you can check the crown jewels, and you can bring the scale out, and you'll actually scan it to the cloud, and then you can send it to the cloud out to multiple devices. It's really encrypting out and you can make the question. It depends on the hardware requirements on the mobile devices. It's sometimes it's just kind of on out there, but it's just very happy and stuff like that. But if you, if you want to uh, further extend it to not supporting it, you have to be self propagated to the data level and the data level to allow the unsupported devices to get from that point of view to solve that all the things that are in the data level. So if you're highly interested in some of the pieces of the data level, So that's a fantastic question. So since BYOD, I'm not going to talk about it, BYOD is where every company, including when I work for, work is going to, right? So the way you get around the BYOB is, like I said, um, you have with the, uh, the software, the software basically creates a tunnel out to the individual device. Those devices that are supported will actually have an agent sitting on that device. The ones that aren't supported, you can have an application, that application only is in the ground. And the wrapping on that application allows the rest of the device to operate. Um, obviously, I'm a little bit nervous about my company having access to the right to my device, my iPhone, my right to the internet, and my internet. But that's the way. Yeah, I don't know where to go that way. Anybody else? All right, so again, apologize for the shortness, but this is what they call a lightning. So you're getting about six months of research into about 30 minutes. Appreciate your time. If you have any questions, stay with me afterwards. Thank you.